Everybody wants to have fast builds. So um, you have a build that does complicated things and you use a tool uh, that it has a bunch of features, it's very flexible, and it's, built, and it's based on Java Groovy, and you also wanted to make it fast. That's interesting. Um, I'm gonna help you out. Uh, let's see what we can do. So um, I'm an engineer at LinkedIn. Uh, one of my teams uh, manages the integration of Gradle in our projects. We've got over a hundred of plugins, and we have a thousand or hundreds of uh, products that use uh, our plugins. Uh, I'm an author of Mokito. Anyone uses Mokito for mocking in Java? Awesome. Anyone uses JMock? Excellent. Oh, we're going to talk later. Um, I'm a father of two creatures. I love them very much on a good day. Uh, today is a great day. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for choosing this presentation. And let's get started with fast builds. So first, um, I want to find out about you. So how many of you don't have any Gradle builds yet? And you're just considering. OK, just a few hands in the air. How many of you have already fast builds? <laughs> I have to talk to you. <laughs> Nobody? Come on. There must be a Hello World build. OK, no. OK, so um, how many of you want a fast build in your particular project? Like almost everybody. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how many of you is in the position that um, you want to have fast build in all your organization? For example, you build plugins for your company. OK, bunch of hands. Pretty cool. And some of you want fast builds for everybody, right? You have uh, open source plugins that are used by the masses, or you work for Gradle, right? So um, in this session, I'm going to focus on two uh, groups. So how to make the build faster in your particular project, and how to make all builds in the organization faster. And the, the latter part of my presentation is what we do at LinkedIn. Okay, a um, couple of months ago, I got a call from my friend in Poland, and he asked me, hey, Stepan, can you help making our build fast? And I said what an honest consultant should say, no. Uh, there's, a, there's no cookie cutter recipe for getting your build fast, unfortunately. Uh, this is a process, and it's a pretty standard one. You measure, you identify bottlenecks, you find out what's slow, and you optimize, and then you measure again. And that's what you got to do. Uh, so let me uh, bring up the story of my friend who got his build from 19 minutes to 8 minutes. He wrote a ni nice blog post after that. He, it was uh, retweeted a few times, so many of you might have uh, read that. Uh, his name is Marcin uh, Grzejszczak. He has an awesome last name. I should have that last name. I would be Stepan Grzejszczak. Now go try to spell this. <laughs> um, so first, he got his build down from 19 minutes to 15 minutes. Um, and then some basic things that they've used. So they use dash dash profile functionality of Gradle. It comes with every Gradle build, dash dash profile. You will find out which tasks are the slowest one, which, what are the areas in your build that require optimization. It's a basic thing. Many don't uh, use it or don't know about it. Uh, if I have some time, I'm going to demo it. How many of you guys have used or used dash dash profile? Oh, a bunch of you. Awesome. Good to hear. Um, the first thing that they've discovered is that there are actually different workflows, different modes of the build, different use cases. CI needs different things. Developer needs different things. When they want to publish and deploy the artifacts out there uh, and release them, they want different things to happen during the build. And Gradle is a great tool to model those workflows in the build explicitly in your build of Gradle files. Right? It's not like Maven clean install for everybody. It's really, it's really declarative, and, and you can, we can actually identify those workflows um, and encode them in the build of Gradle files. Um, they discovered that in the dev modes, they don't need to do many things. Um, this especially applies to various aspects of the web front end pipeline, like related to JavaScript. Uh, the minification of the JavaScript was not necessarily for the local builds. They found out some ways to optimize uh, GWT. Um, in general, the assets processing for the web. Uh, this, is, this is the area where they found many, uh, many various uh, things to make the build faster. Um, one thing that we do at LinkedIn is for the dev builds, we don't, uh, we don't create Java doc and sources jars for the dev builds. It's like a simple thing to do. Um, and again, like those are just small implementations. The, the important 
pattern here is the workflows and identification of the workflows and encoding them in your build.gradle files. Um, the next thing that helped my friend to go down from 90 minutes was uh, identifying slow tests. They've used the Gradle test profile plugin that is available at GitHub. Uh, it's a rather simple plugin, but um, offers a pretty neat way to identify the tests that are slow. We don't want slow tests, we want fast tests, obviously. There's a, um, to get your tests to the right quality level, that they are fast and they are good, it's like a, there are a whole bunch of things that, that can be done. I'm gonna just stretch, uh, scratch the surface here. Um, one of the things that I like is the testing pyramid. Anybody heard about testing pyramid before? Okay, a couple of you. So testing pyramid is about the right ratio between your unit tests and integration tests, between the various kinds of tests. Um, basically, you want this ratio to be well balanced. Uh, you wanna have a lot of unit tests because they are cheap, uh, easy to maintain, they execute really fast. You're gonna have thousands of them and yet they execute under two seconds, let's say. Uh, and then there, is, there are integration tests as well. Uh, and then we wanna have a moderate number of integration tests because those guys are a little bit harder to maintain, more costly. When they fail, debugging is usually mm, not so obvious. Um, and then finally we have those most complicated end-to-end -end UI tests. We don't want to have too much of them. They are the hardest to maintain. They execute the slowly, as they are the slowest suite to execute in your tests. And testing pyramid addresses that. Basically, at the foundation of the pyramid, pyramid, we have unit tests, a lot of them. We have integration tests in the middle. And at the top, we have those end-to-end -end UI tests. Um, the testing pyramid addresses uh, the slow tests. Um, the projects that have imbalance, they have the um, reversed pyramid, that majority of their tests is UI tests or integration tests. They suffer, the tests are slow. This reduces build time. So um, slow test is something that, that contributes to the slowness of your build, I guess, the, big, uh, the biggest. Um, for the Gradle project itself, it's, uh, it's quite a long to get the feedback from entire, like if we want to run this, all the suites of integration tests against all platforms uh, with various modes, with demon mode, with parallel mode, that's uh, quite a bit of waiting for that feedback. So um, getting that as fast as possible is the good thing to do. There are, there are other things that you can do to make your tests uh, faster, avoiding sleeps. Just, there's always a way to refactor your production code and your tests so that you don't need to have sleeps in your code. Um, execution of the test. Um, not sure if you remember back in the old days, in the days of Ant, the team was happily developing tests. And at some point, uh, one test started to upset some other tests during the execution because there was some coupling between those tests, there was some state that was shared. Um, the basic approach to that was to, hey, let's just execute every test in the separate JVM. That's gonna solve the problem of state, no problem. And suddenly, uh, the team, uh, a couple of weeks later, has uh, two thousands of tests that execute in five minutes or 10 minutes, instead of executing under two seconds, because they pay the cost of forking the JVM for every single uh, test method, which is very, very suboptimal. So uh, we don't want that. We, will, we, we want the tests to be written in a way that they can be executed in a single JVM so that they are really fast. Um, I'm gonna talk about the parallelization of the test, but that's also important. So they should, be, uh, they should be written in a way that they can be parallelized and executed um, <clears throat> on the same machine. Even our phones now have eight or four cores at least. So we need to parallelize big time. Uh, another idea is data samples in your unit test. It's like, Maybe it's not necessary to have 10,000 elements of some kind in order to validate certain behavior. Maybe 10 elements or two elements is enough. So those are like small various things that you can do. There's a, I could have a separate co a presentation about like getting the uh, test to the highest possible quality, which means they are fast and your build is fast. But that's important, getting your builds uh, fast. So um, my friend got to 50 minutes after identifying a couple of slow tests and I think removing them uh, or fixing them. Um, now, um, now he got uh, better than 50 minutes. He got to 30 minutes by using the parallel option. Um, initially, they didn't use the parallel feature because they were worried about, the, about using an incubating feature. And if there is a single thing I want to convey during this presentation is like fear not of 
incubating features. There are diamonds. Actually, Hans, I want to rename incubating to diamond features so that, uh, so that you are more inclined to use them. Um, incubating features are not betas, are not things that are half-baked and not working half of the time. There are things that meet the highest quality standards at Gradle. They, um, they have very good code coverage. Uh, they are very well designed and thought through. They are incubating because when it comes to public API, it's better to get some feedback early. Uh, then, because uh, at Gradle, we want to have uh, backwards, we are very keen on maintaining backwards compatibility, and yet it's hard to invent the public API in a way it's going to work for the next two years. Uh, so that's why we want incubating features to get feedback from you guys early. So definitely use incubating features. Uh, at LinkedIn, we use incubating features big time. We use uh, configure and demand, we use parallel builds, and we've been using them for like a year or two years already. So production code is all using that stuff. Um, so, uh, so they've started using parallel build. Um, now, they didn't discover any benefits from using the parallel build for some reason. So they run with dash dash parallel, and yet the build duration is pretty much the same. Now, it's, it's important to understand how the parallel build works at, uh, in Gradle. So it parallelizes within your multi-project build. So if you have a very big build with lots of tests, lots of source code, lots of things that are happening during building, and yet it's a single project build with the single root project, then you are not going to take advantage of the parallel build, at, at least now. At some point, uh, Hans announced uh, at the keynote that there will be parallelization within project at the task level or subtask level so that uh, so you could leverage that uh, but at the moment the out of the box parallel capability does not parallelize within the project hopefully I'm not wrong because things at Gradle change uh, frequently um, so um, now if you have a multi-project build it's also important to have a right balance of things the ideally, the best parallelizable multi-project build uh, for Gradle is the one that has reasonable uh, and similar amount of uh, source code and tests in each of the sub-modules, right? If you have, if in your multi-project build you have one uh, giant project, sub-project that, uh, and then majority of the things are happening in that particular project, uh, then you know, you're not gonna take advantage of the parallel build that much, so the balance so striking the balance is important. And that's what uh, Marcin has done. So he actually, they, they refactored big time their project in order to balance it out and in order to make it uh, neatly parallelizable. Uh, I'll show a demo of the parallel build soon. Um, they've also encountered the problem with the uh, tests that were not parallelizable. So if you have uh, separate sub-projects, um, or even, uh, so in Gradle you can also configure uh, parallel, parallelism at the task level for the particular test. Um, my friend Martin also uh, wanted to use that, but things were not working correctly for him uh, because the tests were not written uh, in the spirit of parallelization. It was they were they were there was some state that was shared. There were some all kinds of things that they need to refactor in order to get them to the shape so that they can be run on, in parallel. So uh, they've done that. Uh, they've actually had to patch some open source libraries too that they've used for testing, uh, but finally they got uh, to 30 minutes from 90 minutes. So parallel was the next uh, ingredient. And then they did the most classic thing you can do to get the build faster. You just, you know, do some, buy some more hardware. I think by now everybody uses uh, um, SSD drives, so that's, that's, that's an obvious thing to do, but like usually more CPUs, uh, faster drives, things like that help. Uh, obviously, we want uh, we don't like we want Gradle and our plugins to be fast on like standard developer machine, not only like supercomputer. Uh, yet, like for for, the, for your build machine, sometimes it's the cheapest option is to just buy better hardware. <coughs> Important is also to use the latest version of Gradle. Um, Gradle 2.4 is amazing. I think that's the biggest performance boost I've seen so far uh, at Gradle especially because uh, Gradle 2.3 was a little bit regressed on that field. So, um, so definitely being on the latest Gradle helps. We are very happy at LinkedIn that the Gradle configuration is, is much slower. There are a bunch of uh, projects at LinkedIn that are rather large and uh, the configuration time is significant for those projects. Using latest version of Gradle also enables you to take advantage of the latest incubating features. 
like the um, parallelizable parallelization of the task level, for example, um, and things that are coming. <coughs> so uh, let's move to faster builds for the organization. Um, so at LinkedIn, um, the, my team uh, is responsible for uh, Gradle plugins, and we want to make sure that all the projects that use those plugins are fast. Uh, we use configure on demand from day one. It was actually developed. Oh, actually, that's actually a pretty good hint. So configure on demand, I think it was developed uh, for LinkedIn. Everybody can use it, of course. Um, so that's another way to speed up your builds. You can hire Gradle to add some features to Gradle uh, to get your builds faster. Um, so how many of you use configure on demand by any chance? OK, about like 10%, I think. So that deserves a, a, a demo. And also we use parallel build. And we use parallel build from like very early, I think. Whenever we started dealing with large projects, we, we had to do parallel builds because it's just without them, it's just too slow. So uh, configure on demand is pretty interesting, so I'm going to demo it. Um, traditionally, Gradle configures all your sub-projects in your multi-project build uh, in order to execute any task. So there's this configuration phase, and I'm going to be simplifying things, but at the end of the configuration phase, we have a task graph. So we have a queue of tasks that the Gradle will execute. And then there's an execution phase. So um, what we have discovered at LinkedIn is that for very large projects, uh, developers often work in a subset of modules, subset of projects. And yet, every time they invoke the build, Gradle configures like all the projects, even though the other projects are completely irrelevant for, the part for that build. So in configure on demand is the feature that makes Gradle smarter and makes Gradle configure only the projects that are needed for the execution. And that's essentially the ongoing strategy for Gradle. Gradle wants to be smart and figure out what things it should do in order to execute the build and what things are not necessary to be done. So I would hope that the, with the new configuration model that is coming with Gradle, uh, configure on demand will get deprecated and Gradle out of the box will be, um, uh, will be smart and not configure things that, not, that don't need to be configured. So let's actually see that in action. So I have a multi-project build. I'm going to build it. Whoa, it's not a light gradle. Sorry about that. I'm using some of the. What? <laughs> oh, God, as, as usual with the demos. Uh, There you go. Thank you. Gradle 2.4, the fastest one. So, okay, let's build it. Uh, this is a, this is a demo project. Uh, so it has 25 sub projects um, to build stuff. Mm, Gradle 2.4 is pretty fast, so we are not going to see the configuration time. We're mostly going to see how things are uh, being executed. So classes are being compiled and tests are being run. Um, but I want to for the first. First run is just a plain, clean build run. The next build, I'm going to do the build with the parallel. And then I'm going to demo the configure and demand. So how many of you use the parallel build? About half of the audience. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So parallel build, definitely way to go. So it's 42 seconds. I'm going to run with parallel now. It's so we have a hot daemon here. So it's, it's, the test is not really great, but, oh, and it's, it's not a clean build. So it's the clean build. So it's not really a good uh, test, but I think it will give, give you a little bit of, uh, of the overview. And this project, since this is a fake project, and it is very well balanced, every sub project contains the same amount of uh, unit tests and classes. So you see it's 13 seconds. If I do it once again with the, without parallel, it's going to be more, I, my guess is about 20 to 30 seconds. So definitely using the parallel build. Um, and definitely looking forward for the upcoming features for Gradle. So parallelization even within a sub-project. Come on. There you go. Almost there. There you go, it's around 30 seconds. So definitely parallel build. 
So uh, at LinkedIn, by default, all the projects are built with parallel. So when uh, someone wants to develop, is he's starting a Gradle project from scratch and he generates the project, uh, he'll have the parallel building by default enabled. Configure on demand and the daemon as well. So, um, so when I do Gradle clean build, you're gonna see the configuration phase at the beginning. It was pretty fast. So for that kind of build that takes 30 seconds, it's hard to say, but actually let's, let's show the profile. So I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna do build with dash dash profile. The configuration, f oh yeah, it's starting new daemon because I control C it. Uh, control C because I uh, killed the uh, build in the middle that turns the, uh, that tears down the daemon. Uh, so let's see w how much of that 30 second build or 20 second build is uh, taken by configuration. Actually, this is too slow, guys. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna CD into one of the projects. Let's go to project six. And I'm gonna do Gradle clean build with dash dash profile. So I'm, I'm building a single sub project, so project number six. So it's eight seconds. I'm going to do the regular, let's say I'm gonna do the up-to-date build, just fully incremental build, not very, but with the profile. And let's take a look at the profile report. Reports. Is it? Reports in the profile. Let's go to the la latest one. So this is the build that was the total build time one second. And let's see configuration time about 600 milliseconds. So about like less than 50% of the time. Let's actually run this build with configure on demand now. So those settings like profile and configure on demand, they can be configured in your Gradle properties file. So do you have various ways of configuring the, uh, it's actually not the profile, but the parallel build, configure on demand or the daemon, uh, this setting can be configured differently. You don't have to specify that from the command line every time you invoke Gradle. So the build is one second. Let's take a look at the profile. It's now, Mr. one. So now the configuration has taken 70 milliseconds instead of 600. So it's a very small project, but um, in the largest project at LinkedIn that has over 3,000 sub projects, uh, configuration time for the entire multi project build takes minutes. Uh, even if you work on the subset of modules, Imagine that you need to wait a couple of minutes before Gradle even does any job, uh, before the build is actually executed. It's just the configuration phase. And I guess the important uh, factor in the, in the fast builds is also the perceived performance of the build. So what we have discovered is that um, people don't mind that much that the build is taking five minutes or six minutes, so long they see that things are being worked on, that the build is cranking, compiling the files and running unit tests. Whereas like in, the, in our largest projects, you execute it and you see that build, uh, Gradle is configuring, configuring things and you kind of, come on, just do the job, right? So that's why uh, we are so keen and we are very waiting for the uh, upcoming changes to the configuration model. I'm so keen to go to the presentation on that matter. And configure on demand helps us at LinkedIn because it, it makes it actually possible to work in this giant project in a subset of modules and configure on demand will make sure that only the projects that needs to be configured are actually configured. Configure on demand is really is, is smart. So if you have inter-project dependencies, it'll figure everything out. So it, it's gonna configure the, the, the correct, the, those projects that need to be configured for your build. Okay. Um, so we also have some wrappers written uh, for this largest project of ours that fuels the configure on demand and uh, selects the specific tasks that need to be executed. Um, so configure on demand is not useful if you invoke it direct. Let's go to, the, to my demo. If I do Gradle build, 
if I do, if I invoke command like that, so Gradle build configure on demand, uh, and I'm doing it from my root project, configure on demand will not give me any benefits because I'm basically invoking the build for the entire thing, right? So um, at LinkedIn to uh, facilitate the configure on demand the best, the, we have some wrappers uh, so that select the right tasks to be executed for uh, typical uh, uh, dev workflows so that people don't have to specify those, uh, mm, those task path by hand. And we hope that we can get rid of those uh, wrappers soon as, as uh, some of the upcoming features to configuration model uh, are here. Um, uh, the important um, thing to, uh, the performance of the particular Gradle plugins that we built at LinkedIn. Um, so we discovered that it's pretty easy to introduce uh, performance regressions to plugins. Uh, because typically plugins are tested on the small projects. So someone that, uh, creates a plugin for doing something interesting with the build. And then when we start using this plugin in our largest project that has over 3,000 modules, it appears that it acts actually a lot to the configuration time of the entire project. So, um, so we actually profile how our uh, Gradle plugins behave during the configuration time. We make sure that as little as possible happens during the configuration time, and we push all the expensive logic to the execution time. That's also a very good strategy for your plugins if you want to have fast builds in your organization. And um, like the, the common pitfalls are resolving dependencies during the configuration time. This is something that we don't want to do. Um, doing some expensive um, um, template replacing and like loading the contents of files, writing files during the configuration uh, time, again, something ideally we want to avoid. Um, so those are the things that we've done. And uh, currently we are pretty happy with the speed of the plugins that we have. Uh, performance is also related to the IDE. So um, importing huge projects into the IDE is, uh, is time consuming. Generating the, if you use traditional methods to integrate with IDE and you generate the metadata for IntelliJ or, or Eclipse, um, this might take a while for large projects. Uh, so this is something we also, uh, we also used the built-in Gradle plugins in, in, in various creative ways to avoid that problem. Uh, the biggest problem we had with this largest project that has over uh, 3,000 modules, this project, when it's loaded to IntelliJ, does not work properly. It's like, I love IntelliJ, but at certain scale, it's just not working uh, properly. So we have ways to generate the partial idea metadata that basically you are able to work on the um, a subset of uh, modules from, the, from your multi-project build in your IDE. I hope I can learn more about the features, uh, about the new Gradle features for the uh, multi-project builds uh, today at the conference uh, because they will also leverage um, uh, those patterns and allow you to work smartly with the IDE. Um, another thing that we've done is for those users that still use Eclipse, uh, because at the end of the day, like everybody will be using IntelliJ at some point. So, like, but like, but keep on using Eclipse. So, no problem. So, um, uh, so for uh, for certain of our um, uh, developers that still use Eclipse, uh, they like Eclipse. When you load the project that has like 3,000 modules, it also we had some performance problems. So, one of the solutions that was invented like long time ago is actually to flatten. All those, multi uh, all those sub projects from this multi project build into the single uh, project in Eclipse. It's like, like it, I feel bad even talking about this pattern because like it's, it makes the class path you know, flat from your entire project. So this is a whole, like this is a, the accuracy of your class path. You can have various problems with, with uh, this approach, uh, but on the other hand, it allowed, it allowed uh, development in Eclipse in a reasonable way. With this huge project, it was not really possible. The, the, the latencies and the, the responsiveness of the IDE was not, was not good. So we, we, uh, so we, had, we came up with uh, various ideas how to use the uh, Gradle plugin smartly to allow development of those large projects. OK. Uh, finally, uh, one of my teams uh, um, integrates the JavaScript build pipeline, uh, and we use Gradle to that. And we want to integrate with the standard uh, LinkedIn tools, the JavaScript tools. 
And uh, we came up with a couple of uh, interesting strategies. This is going to be the main subject of my next talk. Um, um, but we, a um, couple of patterns that we've did uh, is that um, we want to use Gradle for all the heavy lifting for the JavaScript build pipeline. We still want to delegate to certain tools like Ember CLI to do the things that we don't want Gradle to do because there are JavaScript native tools that, uh, that basically have very good uh, functionality in that field. Uh, we w and we want to also very high performance. Uh, the problem with JavaScript is that like, there is some, I don't know, how many of you are the web front-end web devs or consider yourself front-end web devs? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm not sure how, you, how are you comfortable with using Java as your, and Java JVM-based tools for, you know, for standard dev workflows. We found it, that it's pretty uncomfortable for the JavaScript guys to say, to, to, to talk to them, hey, you can use Gradle to do things. And it's like, Gradle, come on, like, it's a Java tool. It's slow, it's big, you know. We don't want to use Java tools. We want to use JavaScript. We want to use Node. This is native, this is fast, and things like that. So we had to somehow figure out a way so that they could have their dev workflows really, f really quick. We, uh, and then we, so we don't want to invoke Gradle and all those tasks and everything for every possible uh, workflow. Um, and the patterns that we do uh, are that uh, Gradle has a wrapper script that is generated. Everybody uses wrapper by now, right? Who does not use the wrapper? Oh, why? Because you have your own wrapper. We use our own bootstrap. You use your own know, bootstrap, right, gotcha. So at LinkedIn, we also don't use wrapper, right? Because we have our own wrapper. So, uh, but um, we actually stole that pattern from Gradle. So for our JavaScript support, we drop a, a wrapper uh, in the project that wants to uh, leverage the JavaScript build pipeline with Gradle. And then there is a direct native access to tools like Node. Uh, and then um, this allows, th this makes the builds and the dev workflows really snappy, really fast. So the web devs, are pretty happy with what we have. I hope so. Um, another thing we done uh, was in, w w that was related to performance is this is something that we are currently working on. So we try. We don't want to use npm to resolve dependencies every time you run the build. We want to uh, leverage the concept of a lock. Uh, this is something that uh, that Netflix guys also have with the Nebula plugins. Uh, this is something that uh, the lock file the that contains the information about your dependencies. We know that from other uh, packaging solutions. And I'm going to get into the more details of that in my JavaScript talk. Uh, but uh, long story short, we, uh, we believe that we're going to make the, uh, the node modules dependency resolution much faster and much more reliable uh, by using log. So this is something that might come with uh, NPM 3.0, maybe. All right. So um, finally, um, the best way to get your build fast is to love your build and love your tests. Uh, just pay attention to that uh, profile, measure, find the bottlenecks. So no complaining, but like working hard on getting your build fast and using latest and greatest Gradle as well. And if you have any questions, I might take, I think, one or two. Any questions? Yep. Oh, the question was whether we use some tricks to speed up the CI builds. Yeah. Um, so, not really, not really. I mean, not, not on LinkedIn. I mean, like, uh, we don't necessarily want the CI build. I mean, the dev build needs to be faster than the CI build because the CI build uses the has better hardware. So we actually can do more things on the CI build. We can do, uh, so this, I, I don't think we have any like particular tricks to make the CI build faster. We, we essentially want every build to be faster. We let the CI builds do the more work than the dev builds. Um, I hope that answers your question. We, at the moment, we don't use the daemon uh, on, on the CI builds, but we want to use the daemon on the CI builds. Any other questions? Um, so we are hoping to leverage some of the upcoming features in the daemon. So daemon in Gradle will be caching more and more. The next session is by Adam Murdoch. It's going to be about Gradle into the future. I'm sure like 
a lot of that presentation will be about the demon and how many good things he, he can do for you. So we ultimately, we want our CI builds to be fast as well, right? And if the daemon gives us some good capabilities of caching, uh, caching, let's say, the configured model in, me in memory so that the next build is really fast, we want to le leverage that. So we do want to leverage uh, daemon. Um, currently, the recommendation, so you need to be careful with using the daemon on the, on the CI build because like CI build is like a, is a different box, right? So if there is a separate process that, you, that, that is running there, this is something that you need to manage and maintain. And when things go wrong, sometimes you need to kill that process. So it adds a little bit more maintenance to it. Now, on your local dev box, daemon is a no-brainer that everybody should use because like this is your box, so you can easily manage the processes and things like that. CI box is something, you know, uh, some, some, something that is not immediately accessible. So. That's why the recommendation is, you know, to be careful and to kind of understand what you're getting into when you use the daemon. But we at LinkedIn, we do want to use the daemon uh, for all our CI builds at some point. We actually started do, uh, having, uh, doing that. So we, we, for a long time, we used the daemon for our CI builds. But at some point, we stopped. I don't quite remember right now what was the reason. I think, I think there were some test failures and there was a theory that is related. So without really validating that th theory completely, the demon was turned off. So uh, there's some story to it. I don't quite remember. We want to get back to it, and we want to use the demon on CI builds too. Yep? Uh, you mentioned you have like a 4,000 module. Uh, 3,000 modules. Over 3,000. Yep? Oh, this is nightmare. Don't, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you don't want to work on projects like that. So we have a strategy to decompose that. So, okay, the question was, how is life of a developer in this 3,000 module build? So that's like a big project. And you don't want to work on big projects. You want to go micro microservices. You want to have small projects that basically are easy to work with, easy to debug. Uh, now, we do have capabilities in our tools to uh, have this kind of uh, mm, architecture where you have small projects that depend on each other and our tools understand the dependencies between those projects and between teams. And when you, uh, when you make your change to your project and you push out that change, uh, our CI infrastructure automatically rebuilds the things that depend on your project and can prevent your publication of a new version of your library. And if your library passes your tests and your dependency and the things that depend on you also work, you get autom your, the, the new next version of your uh, library is automatically published. So we want to have this mode as well for everything at LinkedIn. Uh, this large project that we have, this, uh, we, are on go we, we slowly, gradually, you know, remove some bits and pieces from that and, uh, and separate them to the, sub to the smaller uh, projects, and that's the way to go. Don't have large projects. That's, that's how long that take to build the Oh, so how long does it take to, to build this project? It depends what kind of build we're talking about. But let's say calling Li Gradle build from that project, I think, I'm going to be guessing now because I don't remember the latest numbers. I think it's going to be taking about an hour, one hour. Uh, on the like, state of like, the best possible uh, hardware you can buy at LinkedIn. So it's, it's pretty handy that the standard dev machine at LinkedIn has 64 gigs of RAM and you know, like it's, it's a great machine. So, I th yeah. Okay. So uh, what Danny mentioned was that uh, there are some caveats in the way uh, the profile report has been. We need your we need a, uh, your PR uh, the uh, the pull request, my friend, to fix that in the report. <laughs> So there are some caveats in how the profile report looks and what it shows. Like, um, it's not going to sound nice, but sometimes things don't add up in that report. But it's not because of the logical bugs. It's because uh, when you have parallel build, let's say, you're going to see if you count you know, how long every task has executed, it's not going to add up to the entire build duration, right? Because they are run in parallel. So there's, there are also caveats regarding the dependency resolution that is separately count, accounts for resolution and artifacts download. 
So things like that. So, but that nevertheless, profile report is very useful. It's your way to do the regime of profile of uh, fixing the performance problems. Measure, invest, uh, identify bottlenecks, uh, fix first bottleneck on the list, measure again, and you know, repeat that cycle. Okay, one more question. The, so the question was about controlling the heap size and memory settings for the Gradle build. So like, we have some ways. We, in our plugins, we've coded some interesting features to that. For example, we have um, for all the processes that are forked from Gradle, for example, Java compilation processes, testing processes, we have an uh, automated way to figure out how much memory to allocate to that. So basically, in your Gradle properties, you drop uh, uh, the general amount of memory that you want the build to take, let's say eight gigabytes, and then we kind of try to uh, plot that number to uh, and take under consideration the parallel build. To give a specific example, let's say you want your build to build to run under eight gigabytes of memory. So we have Gradle plugins uh, written at LinkedIn that m m makes it possible for Gradle to smartly allocate uh, enough memory for the fourth processes. So even if you run in parallel build, uh, there's going to be there might be let's say eight separate work, uh, processes that comp that are compiling your code because you have eight thread eight cores. There's going to be eight worker threads in Gradle. This means that there can be eight uh, worker processes that do compilation, and every single worker process has custom uh, memory settings that kind of that the, the number is calculated smartly based on the amount of memory that you have uh, give to that uh, particular build. So that was convoluted, sorry about that. Um, but we have some ways to do that. We use public AP Gradle APIs to do that. Uh, in Gradle, you can configure amount of memory, heap, and stuff like that for all the processes that Gradle forks. This means uh, compiler daemons, test daemons. And um, thank you very much for coming, uh, and hope you to see you at the uh, next my session. All right, guys. Thank you.